OK, well, welcome to lecture three. And what I want to do this morning is talk about social capital in health economics. Because what I was talking about on Friday afternoon was sort of social capital in general and some of the challenges in measuring it. You might wonder what this slide represents. Um, I don't know what you call this. I know you have them. Um, these markings on the road in Japan, but we call them zebra crossings. Um, you may have some equivalent. So what this picture says to me, and it, the relationship to this lecture, is clearly zebras came before zebra crossings because they would just be white lines in a road. If we didn't have something called zebras, we wouldn't be able to call these zebra crossings. So while that's true, it's also absolutely apparent this zebra is crossing this road here because there's a zebra crossing. So the zebra crossing, as it were, is uh, feeding into this zebra's behavior. Um, and so what this is trying to get at, if you think of social capital and health, while we tend to think about um, health might benefit or be an outcome, better health might be an outcome from more social capital, perhaps social capital um, can increase or decrease as a result of health or lack of health. Um, if you think of... Uh, individuals' ability to participate in activities. More healthy, they have much more ability to participate. Uh, less healthy, it's harder to participate. So what this picture was trying to capture is the sort of two-way nature of the relationship between social capital and health. Now, this two-way nature is really important. Because if you just assume that everything goes from changing social capital to changes in health, you might then be a bit surprised when your policy changes social capital and you don't see the change in health you predicted. And you might not see the change you predict because you haven't allowed for the, perhaps the feedback. So there's a change in social capital which might change health, but that change in health itself may also feed back into social capital. That's, so that's why it's important. Um, in case you're wondering, this was a street in uh, Bergen in Norway. Um, very, a lovely city by the sea, famous in Europe for having the highest rainfall of any city. So while it's lovely, it's best when it's not raining. Uh, I should point out this was not a real zebra. You know, it's one of these ones where there's a person at the front and a person at the back. But what's rather nice is these people are barely acknowledging that a zebra is crossing the crossing in front of them. In front of them. Anyway, I, um, I was very pleased with myself to get my phone out in time and, <laughs> and snap that picture. But again, of course, I did it not realizing that I would be talking in, in Kyoto about social capital and health a few years later. Okay, so lecture three, that's, that's what we're, we're about today. The, the, the danger of all this is in about two weeks' time, all you'll remember is something about zebras. <laughs> now, if you can remember the reason why zebras were introduced, great. It works as a, as a learning tool. But if all you remember is a zebra, it, it may not, <laughs> it's not so successful. Okay. Um, I think it's fair to say that health economists came relatively late to the party. They came late to the party. Other people, sociologists, political scientists and others, were, were a bit more active in, in thinking about social capital and in thinking about particularly relationships with health. Uh, but health economists, um, perhaps about 12 years ago, began to get interested in these potential relationships. 
I think it would be fair to summarize the contribution, not that it's huge, but to summarize the contribution of health economics uh, in this area in, in two ways. One, health economists and economists in general have tended to be much more interested in underlying theory and then they go from the theory to testing some sort of empirical relationships. Uh, in much of the social capital literature, people seem to jump quite quickly to the empirical work and quite quickly to looking at how different indicators move together and things like that. They don't always spend much time on, on what the underlying theory might be. Whereas I think it's fair to say health economists tend to be a little bit more interested in that aspect. Um, what are the mechanisms that we think are at work? So if social capital is related to health or health is related to social capital, what are the mechanisms that lead a change in one of these to influence the other? So that's been an area of interest and in contribution to health economists. And related to this, I think it's fair to say that health economists are probably a bit more interested in causation than association. Now, that distinction is really important. Uh, having said that, as we'll come on to, it's always very difficult to establish whether a relationship is causal rather than simply an association. But that's been a theme of the work um, of health economists, I would say. Not just health economists, but that's, been a, that's a way of characterising, I think, what health economists um, have focused on. So what mechanisms might there be at work? Uh, this comes from a, a paper by uh, quite a well-known health economist, Richard Scheffler. And, uh, He suggests there are about four different mechanisms that potentially link social capital to health. And uh, these are, the first one is to do with information. And with more social capital, um, more information typically is available to members of the community. Because if we're seeing social capital as a sort of network and a set of relationships between individuals and between different groups, uh, the more people that you are in some form of relationship with, the more opportunities you have, perhaps, to get information. In the extreme case, suppose you, you don't know very many people in a, in a particular city and you then need to know how do you access health services or where are the best places to go. You may find it quite difficult to access health services if you haven't got information. Whereas if you have lots of different contacts and people that you interact with, one or two of them may be very informative about what you need to do, or the best time to do it, or the best places to go. So that would be an example. So more relationships, more social capital, and more people you trust. You trust what they'll tell you. Um, there's more people to ask. There's more sources of information. And we tend to think, if we have more information, we'll take better decisions. And in a health context, if you're taking better decisions, one imagines better decisions about your health, you're going to, it's going to lead, one hopes, to improvements in health. Oh, excuse me, how about the Yeah. Um, well, one way of handling that, it's be a cheap way to duck out of it slightly, would be to say, well, there's some people you really shouldn't trust. And, um, these people, and you might have some sort of knowledge of them or relationship with them, but um, they, you, you shouldn't be trusting them. And so it's not actually genuine social capital. 
But I think, I think it's fair to say your question deserves a deeper answer than that. And I think the slightly deeper answer is to recognize that not all social capital is necessarily beneficial. It comes back to the idea, are there different types of social capital? Now, this is an extreme example, but suppose you're, you are an um, injecting drug user. The more contacts you've got, the more easily you will be able to access the, the, the products you like to inject into yourself. Um, now, we've been saying more contacts, the more people you trust and the information they give you, more social capital. So these particular increases in social capital for an inj injecting drug user are not leading to better health outcomes. They're leading to, or potentially leading to poorer health outcomes. So I think the point is entirely right. Not all social capital, depending how we measure it, but not all social capital is necessarily um, good for health. We'll come to another example just below that, social norms. So in some descriptions of social capital, it's in terms of social norms, and there's a view taken that the social norm can be a way of um, influencing people's behavior in a very positive direction. But we can also think that the social norm might go in the wrong direction. Suppose the social norm was to um, act in a discriminatory way against groups that weren't part of your, your particular culture. That might be the social norm, and clearly in some countries, sometimes in history, that has been the case, that the, the, the social norm was one of discrimination. Now that's not going to generate good health outcomes. Thinking the more positive one, and the usual way we look at social norms, um, one example would be restrictions on smoking in public places. Now, again, I have to apologize for my lack of knowledge about Japan, but throughout much of the world in the last 10 to 15 years, there has been increasing amount of restriction on smoking in public places. Uh, so much so, when I walk into a, 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 a restaurant or cafe or something in Japan and people are smoking, I, I, part of me goes sort of involuntary jerk. And it's not because I've got a, I, well, I don't smoke, but it's not because I've got a sort of, I can't stand the smell or anything. I just surprised. Because starting in about, Mm, get my dates right. I think Norway actually is one of the first places to ban it from bars and restaurants, probably about 2002. Ireland was about 2003. Scotland was about 2004. Um, England, I think it was 2005 or six, And lots of other countries have, have joined in. Um, even France, um, to some extent, is restricting smoking in public places. Um, so, but anyway, that's, so the, 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 the example here is this, that now people from Britain think the norm is no smoking or very limited smoking in public places. Go back to 2000 and it, it wasn't at all the norm, not remotely. I mean, it might be some restaurants, some might have had a, one part that was smoking, another part was non-smoking. Although I don't know if any of you have noticed the way that smoke does actually go through the air. And so having a non-smoking half and a smoking half is not very different from having smoke everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but that social norm has changed so much. Um, and that's an example, I would say, of a, it's a very positive one for health, for health. Um, I guess even, even in Japan there's some restrictions. I'm thinking of airports, I've seen you walk past sort of ghettos for smokers, sort of glass enclosed areas. 
But that's, that's, that's a positive one. So the social norm has potentially beneficial impacts on health. As I say, you could have social norms, such as some form of discrimination, which is bad for health. Um, the third one here, enhancing the healthcare services and their accessibility. Interestingly, when I, I was just looking at my lecture, as professors do sometimes, look at the lecture notes half an hour or an hour before they're about to give a lecture, I noticed I hadn't given an example. I'd obviously opened the bracket, thinking, I'll put an example in, oh, I'll do it later. And then <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't done it. And I think there's a reason there. When I think about this one, about enhancing healthcare services and their accessibility, the examples I keep thinking of, a lot of them are to do with information. A lot of them are to do with maybe social norms. You know, having a social norm, you know, universal access to healthcare. I think it has become, in most places, a social norm. And so I have difficulty coming up with a distinctive example where the social capital enhances healthcare services and the accessibility to it. That's not to do with information. That's not to do with a, some sort, form of social norms. Maybe you can give me an example. I can come up with an example. Please. In the old days of China, maybe in the start of the new China, there are some villages, they start to build like clinics, the village clinics. Um, before that time, there's no such clinics. But uh, at that time, some village began to build up some um, village mm -hmm. uh, clinics for common uh, for, for common use. The people in that village can use the mm. uh, resource, medical resources freely. Okay, and so I, I think that's a good example. So that means possibly the villagers trusted each other enough yes. that they would work together because it would take sacrifice and effort to you know, build something that can provide health care. Um, and they trust that they will then be able to get access to it themselves. And so that, the social capital here is the trust that led to the cooperation between the, the villagers. Yes, that you can do more by spreading risk or sharing risk yeah. with others. So are you saying that not only did China invent paper and gunpowder, they invented health insurance? Yes. It's possible. I can't, I can't, uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, so I think that, yeah, that's an example. So but, but because of the existence of enough trust, that led to the activity, which then meant that there was some level of healthcare provision and accessibility of health services, which otherwise wouldn't have been there. Hmm. Any other examples? Right, and do you think that sort of system has developed partly because yeah. of the social capital that exists yeah. or, or back then existed? Yeah, 99%, mm -hmm. but we have some financial issue, of course. <laughs> right, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Right, so, we, so there are examples here. Um, I, can now, oh, I can now put something in there and close the bracket for next time. And the fourth mechanism that um, Scheffler 
identifies is um, in terms of offering psychosocial su support networks. Um, the more people you have, more relatives, more friends, more family members, or the better you get on with your neighbours, uh, the more volunteers there are in a community, uh, the more supply of informal care there will be available. So uh, that's another mechanism. Right, so graphically, just, just um, what he is saying, and he wants to emphasize, is as a consequence of social capital and higher levels of social capital, through these four mechanisms, we anticipate beneficial impacts on, on health. But he's very keen to emphasize that these changes in health are then going to feed back into the social capital. And I guess, we, if we stretch our example, if we're thinking of our Chinese village, if they then have better health services and health does improve, the villages are then, villages are then better able to maintain those services or indeed to expand them. Um, and as a result of a successful cooperation, perhaps people trust each other all the more and so social capital is increasing, which is a very sort of optimistic, rosy view of the world. Remembering these things can go in the other direction. Um, if there's not enough trust, perhaps people become indeed less trustworthy and the fact that the social norm becomes don't trust people, you go in the opposite direction and, and things are getting worse and worse. Um, just in passing, as I was emphasizing um, on Friday, we've got community social capital, we've got individual social capital. Um, just what the relationship is, is still slightly up in the air. And the question I closed with on, one of the questions I closed with on Friday was, is community social capital just the sort of aggregation of individual, or is it something distinctive? Uh, Sheffield doesn't answer that one. Right, and that's just reminding you about it. Um, viewed this way, it kind of looks as if you can go from... Oh, sorry, I, when I wish to point, I keep hitting the wrong button. Um, this way of defining it does make community social capital look as if it is somehow the, the average or the aggregate of individual social capital. So individual social capital is the levels of trust, the group working, the networking, the memberships, the corporations that an individual has with society around them. And then the community social capital in this view of the world is a, a sort of overall measure of how many of these relationships there are within a population. So rather than just focusing on the individual and looking at their relationships, you're looking within the community. So that way of looking at it does seem to suggest um, community social capital could be measured by somehow adding up or combining all the individual uh, social capital. But as I said, there's a question mark whether there's something extra there that's being missed. Please. Okay, right. For an individual, we can think of the level of trust. I trust you very much. I trust you a bit. I don't trust you. So that's a level of trust. Now, if we, we, if we think, imagine sort of beams going out, connecting all our heads, and then you've got a beam coming back this way. You trust me a lot. 
or little, but we can imagine there's another one across here and um, you trust a lot or little. And once we, if you like, take the average of all these connections, an average of the individual levels of trust, we're getting what is being described here as the density of trust. Thank you. Yeah? And, and so the density of trust would be quite low if in our individual relationships we have a low level, but the more we have a higher level, a higher density is developing. I think that's what it's trying to get at. But that view of the world assumes there's nothing else. You know, it's individual trust and we can add it up and we get community, social capital. But sometimes there's a sense that maybe there is more. There's something rather sort of indefinable. And I suggested maybe one way of looking at it, and I'll come on in this afternoon's lecture, is to think in terms of externalities or spillover effects. And, so, and also something called public goods which I'll be talking about this afternoon. And that's, in, that's, in economic jargon, would explain why um, community social capital might somehow be bigger than just adding together the individual elements. So, um, there's a real challenge in disentangling the effect of social capital on health. Now, we definitely anticipate there could well be causation from social capital to health. And I've just been running through those four mechanisms that Scheffler believes might be present. But while that's true, I think there's very good reasons to believe health is likely to influence social capital. And it may well be that um, these different mechanisms that we were looking at, the four mechanisms, um, they may operate synergistically. So if, if two of them are present, you get even more of an impact. If more are present, you're getting stronger impact too. And so it's going to be quite difficult to disentangle the relationship between some change in social capital and a change in health. Partly because that change in social capital is not happening in isolation. It may be impacting on the other elements of social capital. And partly because any change in health that seems to come, arise from the change in social capital will also be feeding back in and changing the levels of social capital. And it's going to be really important to try and understand these, um, this rather tangled mess of, um, of effects because you need to understand the, the mechanism by which a change in some form of social capital leads to a change in health. And not just understand the mechanism, you need to be able to some extent quantify that mechanism, quantify the, the size, the strength of relationship if you're going to design appropriate policies to improve health. Just take a very simplistic economic point of view, there's lots of th ways, I'll talk more about these this afternoon, there's lots of ways we might be able to increase social capital. But if we can't quantify the benefits in terms of improved health that arise from the change in social capital, how do we know what resources it's worth and what effort it's worth putting in to increasing social capital. So we might be fairly confident if we adopt policies which increase social capital, we'll get better health. But if we're going to make a decision about whether to implement a particular policy, we need quanti quantifiable information on the impact on health. We need to know just, and we need to know how much it costs to increase social capital. But we'll get on to that more this afternoon. Right, here is an example of a um, typical economic approach. Uh, and I, I'm not going to go through it in huge detail, but just enough to give you the sort of flavour of how economists, to some extent health economists, 
go about it. Economists like, first of all, to start by developing a theoretical model. And a very standard approach in economics is to start with something called a, must press the green button, a utility function. Now, um, all this is saying, utility here, if you like, is a measure of um, well-being, shall we say. We might call it welfare. Some people might even argue it's almost happiness. Well, I think happiness becomes off sort of rather refined and maybe doesn't quite capture it. But uh, let's call it general well-being. Um, and the utility function is specifying a relationship between the well-being of the individual and the things that improve or diminish that well-being. And so, um, in this case, Folland is started by um, asserting or assuming that individual's well-being or utility is a function of the amount of social capital, their health, health inputs, and X, everything else, all the other goods. So in this way, I'm sure economists are kidding themselves, but they somehow think they're capturing the whole world. <laughs> because they, what have we got here? We've got the well-being of the individual. Um, we've got the social capital that we're particularly trying to identify its impact. We've got health. We've got inputs to health. And we've got everything else. The X, all other goods and services. And the standard approach in economics is to then maximize that utility function, you know, find at what point it reaches a maximum, with respect to a budget constraint. And the budget constraint is simply that your budget has to be greater or equal to the health inputs you're consuming times the price of the health inputs plus X. Now, X doesn't have a price in front of it because to make life simple, we normalize the price to one. So you can imagine, actually, I shouldn't be, I'm, I'm probably doing economics a disservice here, but um, so there's actually a price of all other goods, but we normalize it to one, and so it disappears. And so we have this very simple budget constraint that the, the, the amount you spend has to be, or the amount of money you have available to spend has to be greater than the amount you spend, and the amount you spend is what's on the right, right hand side. And so you maximize utility, and you're, you're trying to find out in what circumstance will this individual, what combinations of X, C, S, etc., what combinations will give the individual the greatest well being, or sometimes satisfaction, sometimes utility, given their budget constraint? Because, of course, as we increase the budget constraint, we can all consume more health inputs, we can all consume more of other goods, and that will make us better off. Uh, but we, we can't increase our budget constraint, we've got a certain amount available to us. So that's where he starts. He then um, develops some predictions from this simple model. First of all, assuming that the um, health input, C, is a, a health good something that will have a beneficial impact on health. For example, clinic visits. Or it could be medicine or something like that. He then looks at a situation where this health input is actually a bad, a health bad. So that could now be um, things like um, tobacco consumption or alcohol or that sort of thing. So that's his underlying model and he developed some predictions about the relationship between these uh, different elements. He then, in the empirical part of his paper, goes on to look at four what he calls healthy risk behaviours. I don't know why he doesn't say health risk, but healthy risk behaviours is how he describes them. And there's four behaviours he looks at. Smoking, 
um, cocaine use. I should point out S. Folland, Sherman Folland is an American, and this, I think they're a bit more interested in cocaine than the rest of the world is. Um, I don't know why. It might be an interesting soci sociological study why cocaine consumption is high in the US. Anyway, cocaine use. Um, inactivity, that's the being too sedentary. I actually, every half hour I should get you all to stand up and then sit down again. It's good for you. It's, re it's really bad just to be sitting there all day, you know that. Anyway, so inactivity, physical inactivity. So he's going to look at that form of behaviour. And the final thing he's looking at is mortality from cirrhosis. Why he's chosen that one, maybe he just had better data available on it. Um, I'm not sure. But of course, a main driver of cirrhosis, well, probably having unfortunate genetics would be a factor. But the main driver is um, excessive consumption of alcohol, among other things. So those are the four empirical areas he looks at. He has cross-section data for 50 US states. As an aside, I should say, um, one of my favorite activities with my daughter when she was a child was um, I would challenge her to tell me all the US states alphabetically, the 50 of them. And she got too good at that, so I said, OK, let's do the state capitals. <laughs> now, that is tricky, because they're not always the big cities. They're sometimes funny little places. Anyway, the 50 US states, which I'll give you alphabetically if you need them later. Actually, if, if the computer fails again, we can get on to what's the, what are the US state capitals alphabetically. <laughs> anyway, um, so he's got data at state level at a particular point in time, hence cross-section data, uh, for the, all 50 states. He's got um, data from Putnam's Index of Community Social Capital to capture aspects of social capital outside of the family. He's then particularly concerned in his paper to argue that too often the family and its contribution to social capital has been left out. And if we look at, um, we'll look again at Putnam's index, which I did introduce on Friday. And it is true that Putnam's index doesn't really seem to capture family. Uh, and so Folland is very keen to argue that an important element of, not just Folland, but he is particularly keen to argue that an important element of social capital is the family element. And so his measure he has available to capture that is the percent married. And it does say married, not percent um, in partnership. Um, and the third measure he considers for social capital is av average family size. Now again, it's the idea of the bonding social capital within the family. The bigger the family size, there might be more social capital. His particular argument is the larger your family size, um, the greater the increase in, in the valuation of your own health. So suppose in the extreme, if you're a family of one, you care about your health, maybe, but you don't care so very much. If you're a family of two, you care a bit more because you're not thinking just of yourself, you're thinking of the other person. Now, I don't know how far this goes, but family of 10, Maybe you care even more about your health because there's all these other people you, in a relationship with you. So I think there's a plausibility about that. Uh, so those are his three measures of social capital. Uh, the, he introduces some what he calls control variables. Uh, these are factors that he argues might influence health and he wants to control for them because he's trying to isolate the impact of changes in social capital or differences in social capital, different levels of social capital. And so he wants to control for other factors which might be influencing health. And he argues um, there's an education might be one, 
And so, again, of course, it's highly measurable what percentage of the statewide population have a BA or bachelor's baccalaureate degree. Um, personal income per capita, again, highly measurable. And so he's got the average income per capita. That should be personnel. Never mind. Um, I transcribed it from Folland. He's got personnel income per capita. Higher income um, tends to have a beneficial effect on health. And poverty rate, the idea there that the proportion of households who are below some defined poverty line, the greater that proportion, that's going to have a downward impact on the average health in the state. What I'm suggesting here is, might these things not also influence social capital? Um, maybe if you've got higher income per capita, you're more willing to trust people because you can survive a few setbacks more easily. I don't know if you're wealthier. That's a good question. Do wealthy people trust people more than poor people trust people? What do you think? Do wealthy people tend to trust others more or less than poor people trust others? Well, I don't expect you to have a sort of statistic in your head and that sort of thing. Do you have a view? Do you think it's possible there might be a relationship between level of trust and income levels? I'm seeing one nod. Okay. Um, what about education? So a higher percentage with reaching this level of, sort of undergraduate degree. Do you think a higher percentage of people in, a, in, an, in, a, in an area, in a state, might be associated or might more than be associated, might influence, might be part related to social capital? Mm. So anyway, Folland is, includes these as it were to control for differences in health. But he might be introducing a problem here by putting these things in. If they are related to social capital, that's going to kind of make it hard to argue that up here he's identified the, the link to social capital. Anyway, yeah. They're different measures, yes. I mean, the underlying concept here is level of income somehow defined or level of wealth, some sort of measure of socioeconomic advantage or disadvantage. That may be a determinant, one of the determinants of health. Uh, these are alternative ways of measuring it. Of course, they won't always move perfectly together, so they might each contain a bit of information. Yes, I think you could see them as the same, different measures of the same concept. Okay, just remind you about Putnam's uh, index. Now, this is available in a, for certain years for all the US states. So that was one reason why he, he followed and used it. But I remind you, um, as Folland emphasizes, the family doesn't really come into this. Well, it doesn't come into this. Um, and uh, it's maybe a good point Follin's making that potentially important part of social capital is relationships within a family. And uh, this won't capture it. Now, remember, we did have, well, did we have? I think we had some doubts on Friday just about some of the parts of this, just do they, what are they measuring? But th this is a, a widely used measure. So, um, what did he find? So remember there were four behaviors that he was looking at. Um, smoking, 
cocaine use in activity, and it was in activity among the over 65s actually. Uh, but anyway, in activity and um, cirrhosis mortality rate. And the negative and positive here is simply the, the sign of the coefficient in the statistical relationship in, in the regression model. Uh, so, uh, and the slightly larger font and bold means that was statistically significant. Whereas, so um, in the top, top right corner here, this negative, community social capital, negative cirrhosis mortality, implies that the higher the rate of so community, the measure of community social capital, the lower cirrhosis mortality, but it wasn't statistically significant. Okay, so it's giving the direction, but not the, um, but it's, it's not statistically significant. In the bold one below it, uh, higher the percentage married, the lower the, um, the cirrhosis mortality rate, and that was statistically significant. This missing box here was um, the the data on inactivity was for married couples over 65, so they're all married. So we, that's why there's no, um, uh, that's, so that's why married wasn't a, a variable in this particular equation. So remember these, um, th these top three, I've done it again. Why am I so slow to learn? The top three are argue to be different measures of social capital. The bottom three were the, the controls, factors that were thought potentially to affect health, that you're controlling for differences between the different states. And uh, well, the, there does seem to be a relationship between income per capita and smoking and cocaine use uh, and inactivity is lower with higher income per capita so that maybe means they can these retired people can afford to go and play golf that's a silly example but you know they've got time and they've got resource and so maybe they can travel around or they can do more um, and um, yeah, higher, higher income associated with uh, lower cirrhosis mortality. Um, education, <laughs> it's not significant, but uh, more education, fewer smokers, that's what you might have predicted. More education, more cocaine users. Um, don't know, there's possibly some sort of confounding going on. Um, more education, less inactive. Well, more education, you know you shouldn't, you know, you know it's, you're more likely to know inactivity is bad for you. Not statistically significant, however. And uh, finally, more education, less cirrhosis. That might be plausible. So, um, he's found some evidence here of significant relationships. Um, the point here is, we're not anywhere closer to knowing that they're causal, not in this study. They're just associations, but they're associations that he was predicting from his theoretical model. Okay, so that's, a, that's a, 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 an, an, an example. All right, okay, so let's, t thank you for asking because it's really important, you do ask because if I sort of just sort of say something and then I, I think, okay, that's fine, it's, it's good that you ask. Let's take the first one. So these are, are four different equations, four different outcomes that's been looked at. So for example, what is the percentage of probably adult smokers in each of the 50 states? And you're regressing that percentage 
that's the dependent variable, you're regressing the percentage on these independent variables. Now, th three of them are argued to be measures of social capital. Another three are included as control variables because it's thought they might be important in influencing health outcomes or health behaviours. Um, here it's a behaviour, percent smokers. And so you're putting that in because you're trying to isolate the impact of social capital on, or the association between social capital and the behaviour. And so you want other reasons that drive differences in smoking, you want to control for. And that's, and I, that's why I've made them a slightly different colour, just to remind myself. So the, the blue ones are, to the extent that they're statistically significant, some of them are, and they're the expected sign, that would be support for this relationship between social capital and health behaviours. Uh, the grey ones are there to control for differences between health, between states, in factors which might influence health or health behaviours. And a few of those were significant. Well, not very many, but a few of them were. Um, so he would argue he's come up with evidence of um, how social capital is influencing health or health behaviour. And he would kind of, well, almost ignore this bit because it was in there to control for differences between states. I'm quite happy to highlight this bit as well because of what I was just arguing in the previous slide, that arguably these things, the education measure, maybe the socioeconomic measure, might also be related themselves, not just to health or health behaviour, but also related um, to social capital. That's right. This is, um, maybe if I'd actually put numbers, you'd see, oh, it's a regression. Um, yes. So the percent, for example, you've got 50 observations, one for each state, and you, you, the dependent variable in this case would be what percentage of adults in that state are smokers. You know, 18%, 25%, 12%. And you're regressing that percentage on these measures. So, for example, on the percentage of people in the state who are married. Um, on the average family size in that state. And so what you're then trying to see in the regression is as family size increases, is that associated with any difference in level of um, these behaviours? And that significant negative coefficient is saying, maybe this is surprising, that larger family sizes are associated with lower rates of smoking. Um, you're putting all six in at once. These three here, he argues, are control variables. These three are, for him, social capital variables. But they're all in the equation at the same time. That's right. A multiple, sorry, a multivariate regression. You've got them all in at the same time. Yes. Please. Your question before was, is the relation between these the three uh, last variables and the social capital, and you connected it just to trust? Um, trust, um, networks, networks, possibly social norms, although whether we're managing to pick up social norms here, well, maybe marriage. Um, So how can you put them in the same model using them as controls? 
uh, um, these. Yes. Um, well, how can you? Um, how can Folland? I didn't. I <laughs> don't, we have an expression, don't shoot the messenger. Um, I, I'm just the messenger. <laughs> um, I agree. I think, I think it's quite possible that they are related to social capital in some way. And therefore, if you include them, and they are, well, equally, if you exclude them and they are, you're going to ch change your results. Uh, and he doesn't seem to have, well, he hasn't, he's, he, he's, he's ignoring that. Uh, yeah, so there's no justification in his, in his study of it. I don't recall him justifying it. I mean, he, he's a little bit sort of, um, and then, so, uh, it's a good, very good paper. Um, he sort of says, well, and these were included as control variables. Oh because they were expected to influence health, plausibly, influ I think he uses the word plausibly, plausibly influence health. And the unstated bit is, and not be related to social capital, that he doesn't actually say, and not related to social capital. Okay, um, so that's that one. Now, this is moving um, on to a Norwegian study, um, the authors, Tur Iversen, who actually I know reasonably well. Um, he's from Oslo. Now, um, he was absolutely clear throughout his paper, it's always associations, associations, associations. He doesn't want anybody to think that he's saying anything about causation. And so he had quite rich data set for um, 1998, and the measures he was looking at, uh, trying to explain, were self-assessed health, um, a general health measure, uh, and also um, a measure restricted to mental health. So that's what he's tr going to try and explain. So, so this is individual level data, and he's trying to explain differences in people's self-reported health, general health, and also in their self-assessed or unreported mental health. And so his series of, 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 of um, measures he looked at, things like has at least one close friend, and we came across that one on, on Friday, um, married or living with partner, Lots of Norwegians live with their partner uh, and have children with their partner. And so if you use just married in a Norwegian context, you would be understating the amount of social capital. So married or living with partner. Member of religious organization, church attendance relative to population. Now that's, um, these are all individual va variables. Church attendance relative to population is a ca characterization of the locality you're in. So what's the level of church attendance relative to the size of the population? Voted, this is an individual measure, voted in the last election, uh, local election. Did you vote in a local election? This may be quite a good measure. Now think of the other ones we've sometimes seen are things like voting in a presidential election. Presidential election is kind of different. Local election tend to have lower turnouts or more variable turnouts because you are voting for somebody to represent quite a small locality. And so it might be a much more sensitive, potentially sensitive measure than um, things like what we call general elections or presidential elections. Percentage who voted in the last local election, so that's a, for the area, for the locality, that's an individual variable, this is for locality membership of sports organizations um, and sports membership relative to the population. So the sport me uh, you're a member of a sports organization is an individual variable and the other one is an area variable for sports membership. So these are all um, things that have at one time or another been suggested to be indicators of social capital. And thus he's then interested to what extent do they have um, a predicted effect on, for example, general health or mental health. And again, I've just put in the 
the direction, the sign of the coefficient, whether it's positive or negative, and again, if it's in bold, it means it was statistically significant. So he found most of the things that he had included um, had a significant impact, except married and member of religious organization. They weren't statistically significant. Interestingly, however, for this bottom one, sports membership relative to the population, it was a negative impact. Now, that's not what we're expecting. We're expecting um, if, if there's high rates of sports membership in a locality, that's more social capital, there should be a positive effect. Now, he does, um, economists are quite good at this, ex post, comes up with a justification and he thinks it could be if you're, in a, if you're in a locality where sports membership is much more the norm and you're not a member, you might feel as it almost sort of bad about it and it sort of goes in the other direction. So you, you feel worse about yourself because there's all these people being wonderfully healthy and going around in lycra and cycles and carrying squash rackets and things. Um, maybe, maybe, it's, it's stretching. Sorry, this is, this is individual. So as, is, the, is the individual whose self-assessed health is being, we're trying to explain, is the individual a member of a sports organization? And the last one is, what's the level of sports membership relative to the population? You know, um, 10 per thousand or 200 per thousand people are members of a sports organization. Um, mental health. Well, these first five were all positive, significant um, relationships. And again, although not significant, you've got this effect of individual and the average in the, in the locality having different signs down here. But I mean, it's not statistically significant, so you don't have to worry. Um, he then went on and looked at it uh, uh, using um, county data for panel data. So the last study, all in the same paper, this study was a cross-sectional study, one point in time, 1998. He then had panel data for Norwegian counties. Um, so you've got multiple years. It's like a multiple cross-section. Again, self-assessed general health, self-assessed general health. Oh, sorry, <laughs> that should be mental. <clears throat> and um, he had a more restricted data set because this was panel data over time. Um, the cross-section data was richer, but he had married or living with partner, a measure of church attendance relative to the population, percentage voting local, last local election. Um, fundraising per capita. So this is a sort of people's charitable giving. Um, and he's put the, he, ah, no, it's not my typo. <laughs> Sorry, it's not my typo. It is both general health the, the difference was he'd found that these two were highly correlated for some reason. And if you put in two variables that are highly correlated, uh, you're not going to estimate a clear, you're not going to get a clear estimate of the impact of, of one of them. So um, both were general health. In one, he includes percentage you voted in the last local election. In the other, he includes fundraising per capita. And so again, there's some um, inf influence here. Fundraising per capita is an interesting one. We haven't, really, we haven't seen that before. We've seen reference to volunteers. To what, did, did you engage in voluntary activity? But these are essentially charitable donations. Um, I come from a city in um, the northeast of 
Scotland called Aberdeen. And among the rest of the people in Scotland, people from Aberdeen, called Aberdonians, people from Aberdeen are suggested to be very mean, what we say tight with money. Uh, a bit like, dare I say it, the rest of Japan looks at places like Kyoto and Osaka. But, um, according to my wife, she's from Tokyo, so that's, <laughs> she's biased. Anyway, so Abidu, people from Aberdeen have this reputation for being mean. But the facts of the matter are, when you look at the statistics, they year after year donate more money per capita than other places. I give you that as background. But the example I would, I would have loved to have given you, but I couldn't get copyright for it, is there's a very famous postcard of Aberdeen where it's split into two pictures. And it, the photograph's actually taken in 1933. And one picture, it's the main street called Union Street, bright sunny day, you can't see a, per, a single person. Now, it must have been taken early, very early in the morning. The other photograph, companion photograph, is the same street, absolutely full of people, completely full of people. And the, the heading is above one, it says um, Aberdeen um, on, a, on a home collection day. What they mean is um, when people are going around houses to collect money, that's a home collection day. And the other one is Aberdeen on a flag day. And that's when people collect in the street. And if you donate, you get a little pin with a, you may have have them here as well, that says I've donated. Or, and so the flag day picture, when you're going to, the collection's going to be in the street, is the empty street. So everyone stayed at home. And the home collection picture, where everybody's in the street, is everybody's left home because they don't want to have to donate. People come around the house. Anyway, um, I, I, I give you that as a side. It's, it's, it is completely unjustifiable, by the way, I, I emphasize. Aberdonians are very generous. But um, it's a lovely photograph. I just couldn't get copyright approval for that. But, but here is uh, um, this Norwegian health economist actually operation, operationalizing this idea that f the level of financial giving might be correlated with um, health, it might be a good measure of social capital. Right, I'm conscious of the time. Let's just move on. Um, yeah, this one, this paper, getting okay, a little bit more recent now, is trying to estimate this interrelationship, not just social capital, having an effect possibly on health, but health having an effect on social capital. Uh, and to do it, um, th these authors have two measures. They've got an in the individual degree of generalized trust. In other words, individuals' responses to this question. Um, generally speaking, would you say that most people can be trusted? or that you can't be too careful in dealing with people. Please tell me in a score 0 to 10, where 0 means you can't be too careful, and 10 means most people can be trusted. So it's a fairly standard trust question, ranging from 0 to 10. 0, you've virtually no trust in people. 10, you trust virtually everybody, and obviously something in between. And so that's individual measure of generalized trust. Uh, the community measure, or community social capital, is the mean of the individual values so the, in the locality. So if you're interviewing people in different localities, the community social capital measure is the mean value of individual respondents in that locality. So here's an example where quite explicitly the authors are arguing that community social capital is directly a consequence of the individual levels because it's making its measure just the average 
of the individual responses. Um, however, what the authors do is explore different measures of, of, um, of, of the average. Uh, so for example, in the baseline, the, the standard measure, they define this reference group, who are, who are you comparing yourself to, as all people in the same region as the person, individual I, who are at most 10 years older or 10 years younger. So it's an age-based reference group. I'll just repeat that. If we go back, oops, we go back, the individual measure, you just ask the individual respondent about their level of trust. The social capital measure is the average of the individuals, but not the average of everybody, the average of people in your area, 10 years, within a 10 year age range of you, 10 years above, 10 years below. Uh, also then varies it to um, <laughs> quite a complicated one. Residents of the same region as individual I, whose age belongs to the interval age times two plus point two times age. Um, It's like one of these formulas. I don't know if you ever come across them. Um, for men and women, let's say, now I do realize some men prefer men and some women prefer women, but let's just take the example of men and women. There's a for alleged to be a formula. What age range is appropriate? So for a man, let's say, um, it's, half the, it's eight years plus half the age of the woman something like that. So the idea being that um, a 30-year-old man, um, half of the age of 30 is 15 plus 8, 23. So for a 30-year-old man, a 23-year-old woman might be appropriate. Um, or for a 50-year-old man, half of 50, give you 25 plus 8, a 33-year-old woman might be appropriate. I mean, it's wonderfully ingrained sexism. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just an example. Have you ever come across these sort of formulas? No, you haven't. Oh well. Believe me, they exist. Um, I'm sure they have no scientific basis. Although in principle you could model how well relationships survive and work out a formula. Anyway, this is a bit like that. You know, taking, taking age and then a fraction of it and adding in a number and this is giving you a, the reference group. Um, and then the final one um, is another age-based one where it's a sort of sliding scale. Doesn't really matter too much, but it's basically recognizing that, or it's asserting that the community social capital is a, a, can be based on individual measure, but it's, it's not just an average of everybody, it's an average of a, 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 an age-based group, like a reference group. And I think the idea is that you know, younger people when they're thinking about trust and so on, and the um, trust that's in the community, they maybe think, tend to think of people roughly their age, a bit older, a bit younger. Maybe older people, when they're thinking about what is the level of trust in the community, they are thinking about trust in, in a sort of older age range. That's, that's the idea, rather than thinking just a straight average. Okay, um, I think we stop there, <laughs> and I leave you hanging what Rocco et al found, um, and we resume again at um, one o'clock. Is that okay? And, and we can have questions all about this age reference as well. Uh, it's quite an interesting question. Who do you have in mind um, when you are asked to almost, or who would you have in mind if you were characterizing some of these measures in your community? You know, is it every last person, or do you think of a particular group that may be of a similar age to you? Anyway, we'll discuss that um, this afternoon.